Welcome to the last talk for this session, the um, Science of Data Stream. So following on from our previous GPU talk, we got an, another GPU talk on understanding GPUs this time. So it's given by Varun Nair. Uh, Varun is a mathemat mathematician and former script kitty that has worked for various research roles for startups, tech, HFT, and even parliament. Relates to our earlier, earlier talk. <laughs> He learned to program GPUs when, he was, when his program was taking a week to finish and discovered Python, CUDA, and open source on the way, bringing down compute times to four hours. Python is the language he dreams in and has followed him from the cult of OO to the church of functional programming. Hey, right. thank you, Varun. Thank you. Thanks for everyone for coming out today. Um, yeah, as I said, um, so I think the title of my talk is Understanding GPUs, and um, I hope to provide a very different perspective to what Mark did. I don't want to, also want to say that uh, I learned all my GPU programming from Mark's tutorial, so if you have any questions, go to him, not to me. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so there's a few things that I'm trying to get through today. I want to kind of get a high-level overview of how GPUs work, what the CUDA model works like, and I think there's a bit of an irony here in that I'm basically talking about extreme multiprocessing at a Python conference. But you know, <laughs> that's such the reality of you know, uh, programming and machine learning in general nowadays. So there's a few things I want to talk about. So firstly, why, what are GPUs good for? And of course, we have the three big ones. Graphics, which we see Lara Croft and her evolution from 1996 to like now. Cryptocurrency, which is something NVIDIA never talks about as the use of one of their GPUs. And of course, machine learning. So I suppose what is something that unites all of these um, things that go together? And at a really, really simplified level, computer graphics are basically made up of 3D polygons. Movements are done via rotations and skews, which are just matrix operations. So graphics are fundamentally can be decomposed from matrix operations. Machine learning is very, very similar that way. Deep learning is just matrix multiplication. We'll go into that in a bit more detail. But a lot of machine learning is actually just linear algebra. You think about your singular value decompositions that give you like your PCAs. There's all these kind of like uh, linear algebra operations that are really, really local and optimizable in CUDA, and that are really underpin a lot of our machine learning today. And cryptocurrency, which is of course the redheaded stepchild of the three, is really like about solving math problems basically using random search. And that's again something that's fundamentally distributable and something that has to be done across many nodes, and works again really well with the CUDA compute model. So let's start off by like, how do you think with CUDA? What are the things um, that you need to know when you, <clears throat> when you want to program in CUDA? So first of all, let's get some, a quick couple of definitions out of the way. What is CUDA stands for Compute Unified Device Architecture. However, I've never seen this actually written anywhere. Um, so I think this is CUDA is basically its own name at this point. It's not like it stands for something. It just is CUDA. And so CUDA is, GPUs are made up of CUDA cores, which are grouped together in something called streaming multiprocessors. And streaming multiprocessors can be sort of analogous to a core, but they're a bit more a computer core, CPU core, but they're a bit more constrained. And to give you two examples, like a GTX 970 has this kind of configuration, and RTX has that configuration. This gives you kind of an idea of its compute capability, but it's only part of the picture. One thing that CUDA really requires to work really well is a lot of threads doing similar work in the similar areas of memory. Otherwise, it doesn't really work very well. Um, and I think one of the things that really changes the difference from, like, say, programming in OpenMP of some kind of like normal multi-core programming is that you have way more threads than you would ever have. Like it's like you know magnitudes of orders difference, like thousands to ten thousands, versus just like tens in CPU programming. Thread safety is still important, but other those memory access is also a lot less flexible than a CPU. But you have more control of your caches. So this kind of changes fundamentally the way you program in many ways. But to start off with theoretical CUDA, let's sort of let's dive into a couple of simple problems with a couple of assumptions. First assumption is that we have an infinite number of threads all running at the same time. And the second assumption we're going to have is that our memory access is all the same, is all simultaneous. These are both actual lies, but you know there's a good starting point, and we'll come in. Uh, we'll fix our assumptions in the in, in the next few slides. So the first example is adding to arrays. This is your classic tensor operation. This is going to go into deep learning thing. We're, go, we're just basically doing like a you know the bias. Um, so how would a CPU implement this? And a CPU would just have to go loop through every element, add them up together. It's O n. In CUDA land, however, we can actually just spawn n threads, and each of these threads takes control of like adding each index together. So like you know, thread i takes care of adding ai and bi into ci. This makes it O1. So already we're kind of beginning to see like how you know matrix, how linear algebra maps really well to a CUDA device. Summing array. 
code a CPU uh, again, just going to have to go through everything and add it to an accumulator. This apl obviously applies to any kind of reduction approach. And in the CUDA world, we do something slightly different. And so this is a nice picture, um, courtesy of Mark, actually. Um, but how we kind of reduce this, what we do is we take n on two threads, we take the second half of the array, add it to the first half. Then we take the second quarter of the array, add it to the first quarter. And so on and so forth until we get just one element at the end. This, of course, is, this is just a very, very uh, simplified version of how you would do this. But there's obviously far more de depth you can go into in optimization. Finally, I want to talk about matrix multiplication. Matrix multiplication, as I stated, is the under, what underpins deep learning. And this is something that GPUs are really, really, really good at. So similar same idea that we have n squared elements on their output. So we have C1, takes C, the C matrix takes the A matrix and the B matrix. And we take like the first row of this um, left-hand matrix and take the first column of the right-hand matrix. In CUDA land, in CPU land, we have n squared elements. Each element has a dot product that goes to it, which makes it n cubed. Or if you have the magic trick, the n 2.81. But we're not going to deal with that. In the CUDA land, we would spawn n squared threads. Each n squared thread would have an output. It has a thread that calculates the dot product across the, the row and the matrix, uh, row and the column, and therefore kind of giving us a, you know, a, a version of ON. And so I do, do want to point out here that this is where our model starts to fail a little bit. You know, n squared threads may not be reasonable, A, and B, also, like, we have a lot of memory access here. Like, for each time we calculate across C11, C12, C1n, all that, we're constantly rereading the first row of the matrix, and that's actually surprisingly slow. So let's start to talk about what happens when reality sets in in CUDA land. So we have... Um, so first things we need to talk about, let's take a bit of terminology, because I will be dropping this on you here and there. First thing when I say host, I mean the system and the C CPU. Device usually refers to the GPU. SM is the streaming multiprocessor. Kernel is the code that runs on the GPU. And the shared memory is the memory that's available in each um, GPU, um, to SM. So threads in a GPU are kind of sort of spread again into blocks. And then each of these blocks are kind of arranged together in a grid. This is a simple way. This is how um, the sorry. <clears throat> this is how the threads are sort of uh, scheduled. Because obviously we can't have like a million threads running simultaneously. There has to be some fundamental limit. We all know this. And so, th as I said, threads were divided into blocks, and the blocks run these threads 32 at a time. So if you had like 64 threads, you'd have the block running them like you know a warp at each time. And each of these uh, threads in a warp run in, in, in sync. So that's, pretty, that's one of the guarantees you have. And when you're running the actual code, your blocks are kind of a, a, a assigned to each of your SMs on your machine. So if you have, again, like 68 SMs like in a 28, on a 2080 Ti, then of course you're gonna, you want to have that many blocks to actually use the, your um, GPU to the best. In fact, you find that NVIDIA will actually provide you spreadsheets where you can put in your device and it will tell you exactly like what kind of block thread combinations you should be using to maximize throughput. Uh, one thing to notice, note here is that, um, and I'm going to bring this up when I talk about memory, that warps aren't completely like synchronous. It's sort of, at a high level view, they're kind of asynchronous. And what I mean by that is that whenever they have, some, they have to do something which requires them to pause, like a memory access, for example, they kind of just give up control, and then the block will then run another batch of um, warps that, might, um, that might, already have, might have work to do. So that way, you can mask your memory latency quite significantly with CUDA, because you don't always have to like, be waiting for data. Um, so just to quickly throw you a little bit of C++ code here. Again, there's like this, code, this talk has almost no Python code in it. Um, although we've all, the, the, late, the second half will have a lot, a lot of algorithms we're familiar with, but this is talking about the underlying stuff of what's going on. So here we talk about, um, you know, uh, so we have um, the kind of thing. So here this int index tells us what, this is kind of idiomatic CUDA to tell us where we want to operate in the matrix. And we just kind of like, we just simply write like a, a, a function that just does the Y, um, the summation. And that's all we do. We don't really have to do much more than that. And then the kernel will just spread it across the device to do that addition for us. It's very, very straightforward. I want to talk about the memory, because the memory is by far the biggest issue whenever you're programming in CUDA. And this kind of where the hard limits of what a GPU can and cannot do really come through. Very rarely is a GPU compute bound. It can be, but that's rarely the case. And this is really comes back to the situation where O1 is not exactly O1. I'll tell you why. So A, the first two examples I've provided there, AI plus equals BI, and in C equals 3 plus 5. In the standard comp size syntax, we're like, hey, that's just O1. Each of these is just one operation. 
But the first operation has memory latency involved. When that AI has to be um, added to BI, they have to receive both of those data points. And that's just not something that's instantaneous. We know this for even in a CPU, this is an issue. But in a GPU, it's much more explicit. And so as a result, you can't really, you have to kind of really design around the memory access quite a lot. And this kind of limits a lot of what we're talking about. And for example, when I talk about, when you say, you know, doing, you know, trying to access a random element in an array, that's not something that's super fast with the CUDA. Because let's say each thread is accessing a different point in the array, that's not contiguous memory access. So we have a few latency sources in addition to all this. The first one, and this is something that I think we've seen, is that we have to copy the data from the CPU to the GPU. And this is high bandwidth, but high overhead. So you know, sending small amounts of data versus large amounts of data uh, is not quite linear that way. Uh, basically, you almost, always want to batch as much data together as possible. Data from the GPU to the RAM is probably, when, when you're doing any computations, that's the biggest limitation. The CPU to GPU is just kind of like your overhead at the start. And your SM caches are really, really fast. And they're the ones you want to use as much as possible. Anyway, so let's now get to the part which we really wanted to get to, which is um, talking about GPUs in machine learning. OK, so firstly, deep learning. What exactly is deep learning? We've all probably used a bit of PyTorch or TensorFlow. But each layer, each forward pass, is just a matrix multiply. And if anyone has not actually uh, interested, anyone who does deep learning has not implemented their own deep learning, it's a really, really simple thing to do. In fact, I think it's one of the simplest algorithms that we use in ML from a pure mathematical or programming perspective. And one of the, so the forward pass is a matrix multiply. And we've kind of discussed briefly beforehand that this matrix multiply is really, really fast on a GPU. So that's something that we get to speed up. Now, nonlinearity is not going to be vastly different to how it runs on a CPU versus a GPU. But additionally, the back prop that we have is going to use a lot of matrix multiplications. And I've just provided them there for anyone interested. But we have another couple of matrix multiplications coming through. One of the tricky parts here is usually how we cache each for the back prop. But that's something that can be dealt with at a different time. I want to point out here that another thing, that we actually haven't fundamentally changed the way we train neural nets. Gradient descent is a sequential algorithm. We need to see our error, backprop it, see the next batch, get the error backprop. This is, this is still a sequential algorithm. We have not actually touched how the algorithm works. All we've done is improved how those passes work and speed up. The forward pass and the backward pass are now significantly faster because of the GPU. And this is particularly noticeable because in a GPU training, in a, in a, in a neural net training scenario, we could have a lot of like uh, epochs and batches. And I've just taken 20,000 as an example. But that's probably underselling how many uh, forward and backward passes really go through in any kind of neural net training. And when you have those 20x to 30x speed ups that we usually get from like some standard classic uh, GPU trainings, this really adds up when you're going from like, you know, a week to a few hours. And that's something that is obviously really, really noticeable when you're backward and forward and backward passing just so that many times. Um, I wanted to sort of like spread it back and just think about other forms of deep learning. Obviously, that just, uh, this here just talks of the multi-layer perceptron, which is your standard fully connected layer or linear layer, depending on which package you're using. Um, so these have about a 20 to 30x speed up, and that's a pretty well set benchmark. Convolutions are interesting in this case. Why? Because um, convolutions are compute bound on a GPU, which is not quite, which is very uncommon. Because if you can fundamentally think about how a, con a spatial convolution works, we're kind of like running a filter across um, a, ma a matrix. And we don't have as many reads. And this is the lack of read requirement of reading is helps speed up the convolution significantly. I do want to actually point out that the way convolutions are implemented on a GPU are fundamentally very different to how we would implement them on a CPU. And this is, again, something that NVIDIA has really optimized quite a lot for us. And this is something also that actually shares across quite nicely. So actually, for anyone who remember, who's done the neural net research might recognize the AlexNet um, topology there. And one of the things that AlexNet did was to actually share the convolution layers across uh, two GPUs. And this is something that parallelizes really well. In fact, if you're using it in a multi-GPU setup, convolutions, paranize, convolutions parallelize very, very nicely. Now, RNNs are the interesting one here. So RNNs are, from my experience, a lot slower. Um, I don't know if people have been training for a while, but I think for the longest time that we weren't, um, but before QDNN came out, RNNs were actually not much faster on the GPU than were on a CPU. Forward, pro forward pass, yes, but backward prop, not so great. And so this kind of says that, and this is another thing, we're just memory bound here. Um, LSTMs, GRUs have a lot of small units in them, as opposed to these giant matrices 
that we have for uh, multi-layer perceptrons, and the small tiling matrices that we have for convolutions. And this kind of results in RNNs being mostly memory bound and much harder to deal with because they're kind of sequential. I also wanted to point out that besides deep learning, you can find CUDA in expected places. And this is, um, I think um, Rapids has already worked this one out, but um, this is the GMM equation for those of you who, haven't, um, who, who don't recognize the ML. Gaussian mixture models have that likelihood function. It needs to be evaluated for each iteration of expectation maximization. And this summation can be, sp uh, can be spread up across the data points quite significantly. I've, um, in, I've got speed ups of 25x from my uh, research. And I think another thing, this is, um, EM is again fundamentally unchanged in this point. What we're changing is the really one of the expensive computations. We sped that up significantly and that speeds up the overall algorithm. EM has not been suddenly parallelized. EM is still sequential. And EM here, there's expectation maximization. So again, um, but EM is generally, much, in, in, and GMMs tend to be much less expensive to train, so the speed up goes from like, you know, a few hours to minutes, which is still the same X, but you know, weeks to days feels a lot, lot greater in terms of the improvements. I want to talk about classification trees, because this, obviously, XGBoost rules Kaggle, and XGBoost, I have seen get ridiculously good results without any work, and I'm frankly jealous of the <laughs> algorithm being so good. And, but I think I want to talk about XGBoost on the GPU, and I want to talk about uh, th these are three very different approaches to looking at how GPUs can speed up your ML. So for a brief, brief reminder for those who forgot what classification trees are, they're greedy algorithms. They look for the optimal split across each parameter um, and choose the best one for each, at each point. So you have two kind of ad um, adaptations that have found a lot of uh, popularity in ML. One is boosting. Boosting, we have an ensemble of shallow trees. And in this case, it's a sequential algorithm in that, that Predictions that we've, we didn't make so, which we got wrong in the previous iteration, get reweighted to be more heavily penalized. So we're more incentivized to correctly predict them. And this kind of happens in a sequential pattern. Random forests are a completely different take on that. Random forests, we just build many deep trees on a subset of the data and predictors. Why do we do that? We get a bit more, um, um, a little more variance on trying to like find what the best predictors are. And it has a lot more uh, robustness than say X boosting does. And why this is good, because this is not linear algebra, this is not about contiguous axis. This is a very fundamentally different algorithm to what we've seen before. So how do you build a tree in CUDA? And we actually have two different approaches here that you could take. The first approach is, I think, the, the, like what I've seen in academia is called depth first. And what this kind of says is that if you think about it like this, we have 10 parameters in our data set. We can give each of our like cores or our stringy multiprocesses a single parameter to decide where the best split is. And this is um, really, really good when the, at the early stages when we have a large amount of data, but we have, uh, and uh, we need to sort of work out where the best split is across a large n. So boosting fits really well with this kind of strategy because boosting tends to make very shallow trees. We don't have a lot of depth. We don't really have, we have large amounts of data and uh, we still have a large feature space. So it really what matches quite well. The other alternative strat strategy is called breadth first where the full block, instead of trying to look at just one, one feature, one dimension, is going to look at all the dimensions to find the best split. Now, conceptually, this is much better in later stages, where the overhead of our um, launching kernels to do that kind of search is much, much greater, and there's much less data to search through. So this actually works quite well for boosting, for bagging, sorry, because bagging makes much deeper trees and needs to find, like, small, needs to basically group smaller subsets. Again, as I wanted to point out, this is something that I, another key, th key thing that's worth no noting, is that um, fundamentally there's very different implementations than on the CPU. We use uh, a completely different algorithm, and for anyone who's done XGBoost on the GPU so far, might have noticed that you have some sort of randomization on the answer, which is not there on the CPU, I think. And yes, yeah, so that's something that's because of the way the implementation, it has to be fundamentally different to actually be viable on the GPU. Um, this is sort of like another interesting thing. The, and the, and this, because of the fundamental change here, our performance improvements are significantly smaller. This is from the official XGBoost website. And the three, the, the, and one of the things they don't actually talk about, they say, hey, this, goes, this scales really well with N, where N is our data set. It doesn't scale so well for how big our parameter sizes are. So we have like 100, 1,000 parameters. Um, this is, XGBoost is a lot less impressive on its uh, performance and on a GPU. Still better, but not quite like the, d the deep learning levels. Random forests are quite, I'm not, I, I've got a very, lot of variance on the benchmarks there, so I don't want to actually commit to a number. But this also kind of 
has had very limited improvements. And this, um, I'm excited to see where Rapids is going to take this, because until now, this has mostly been a community-driven uh, thing. And for example, there's a package called CUDA tree, which was only about five to six times faster than Sklearn. Then Sklearn kind of, Scikit-learn basically went and improved their implementation. And then the improvement we got in the CUDA version was much reduced. So there are kind of things. This is, this is probably due to the memory access patterns that we have here. Our memory access is very different with uh, CUDA, with, uh, what do you call it, uh, with uh, tree building. And that doesn't fit so well with the whole kind of local um, data access that the GPUs are really, really good at. Okay, so what are some trouble with the GPUs? And this is sort of a bit of personal experience and, and other things I've heard from people who've worked with them. The first thing, by, by and far large, is the GPU RAM. Obviously, you can spend money on like V100s and get 32 gigs, but they're very expensive. Um, even, uh, even a work budget's gonna bulk at that. So you commonly buy, let's say, a 2080 Ti that's got 12 gigs of RAM versus a CPU, which is 128 gigs without even trying. Like you can't, um, this is a big issue when you're trying to like train large models. So now we have this interesting thing because deep learning loves its batching. And as a result, you can actually work around it quite nicely. You can load data in and out and run your forward and backward passes quite happily. However, that's not something that necessarily works so well across all the others. And this, again, requires fundamental changes to the way we think about solving problems. We can't just, you know, the way we learn programming is like memory is cheap, computer is expensive, and now we kind of completely face this other different model, and we need a lot of expertise to be able to solve these problems. Another thing I wanted to point out is that deep learning models have huge number of parameters and can take quite a significant percentage of your memory up, and this is not something people really think about. AlexNet, for example, would take about one gig at, float, at, six, at mixed precision, so that's float 16 for each parameter. Um, Multi-GPU setups, and I think the multi-GPU setups are really a reason because of a computer issue, but rather more a RAM issue. We force them due to RAM problems more so than any other reason. And again, talking about things like asynchronous algorithm changes, they're all, I think, uh, uh, research into asynchronous algorithms are heavily influenced by GPU limitations in many ways. Um, identifiability in uh, machine learning, which by that I mean like if you had a hidden layer in a neural net, there are, about a th there are thousands of configurations that would provi provide identical results. And that's the issue. We can't really train things independently and then merge them. That's, there's, no determinants, there's no identifiability of the parameters there. Synchronized GPUs are slow. This is obviously makes sense because synchronization is always slow. Another thing, performance scaling is variable. We have great benchmarks for certain algorithms like XGBoost and um, CNNs that scale really well, but not everything scales well especially not off the shelf. You may have to do a lot of customization and tweaking. And when you've gone to that stage, you've, got, you've basically started, you've signed up for a lot more work. Sequential algorithms. So sequential algorithms are another thing that are poorly, uh, not, not really, don't really get benefit from the whole CUDA compute model. CUDA compute models are basically built on the side of this tense operation. You have like this matrix, so you have this vector that needs to flow through. But a lot of time series models do use like error, errors from the previous step to sort of uh, to predict in the next step. And that's something that doesn't work well when you need to sort of do like a full um, approach. Convolution approaches work really well, but time series tend to be weak. And this is one of the reasons why RNNs were quite slow. And as I said before, that you know, before QDNN came out, um, we didn't have fast GPU implementations of RNN training. XGBoost, which is the fundamentally sequential algorithm, has a very variable improvement in speed. This, is, of course, can be changed with the number of GPUs you're throwing at it. But the point I'm trying to make is that fundamentally, a GPU has way more flops than a standard CPU. So the sudden improvement is something that you should expect more of, and you don't really get it. Grain descent in EM, again, unchanged. We are under, we're fixing what's really good, what's slow about it, but the change of the algorithm is not there. And this sort of doesn't help us scale well across many different algorithms. And from talking about Bayesian inference before, we're talking about Markov chain Monte Carlo or Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. Again, these are sequential algorithms that see very little benefit from a CUDA compute model. Algorithm changes, and this is something I think is very, very big. Algorithm changes mean that we don't, we don't necessarily have an instant one-to-one -one correlation. If I know how a CPU, how, if I know how to um, program a certain uh, algorithm in ML, I can't automatically um, put it straight into a GPU. There's very big changes that went through. Memory is not as cheap compute is, so this changes the way we do things. DB scan, KNN, and trees have a very different implementation on a CPU versus a GPU, and this is something that's not obvious. I say this mostly as a researcher, but something like that is not, is quite a big thing. Like you're not trying to do, you know, if you're using off the shelf, yeah, you're fine. You have someone else who's an expert in the field trying to optimize that. But if you're trying to find something new, you're gonna find that this kind of has a huge limitation 
because you have this inability to like, you know, just instantly say, hey, this is a great idea. And how do I put this onto my GPU? And you suddenly like, you don't really have a good answer there. And this is something that is, wor is worth considering. Um, and this is, uh, the diagram I put up here is actually a, is a diagram of how convolutions are implemented. So on a GPU, convolutions are reduced to matrix multiplications, which are already heavily optimized, and that allows these things to go really, really fast um, without too much extra work. And finally, this is kind of like leads, all these things kind of lead into another, and a technical debt is something that I think is uh, something that's maybe not the right term here, but we are very heavily dependent on NVIDIA on providing all these libraries. As uh, Mark pointed out, there's a lot of disparate work going on in the CUDA field before this, and we don't have good implementations across many things. And this kind of, this is an interesting problem, because now we have increased compute power in one algorithm. Are we able to sort of do work other algorithms as effectively? Are we limited to just GPU um, compatible programs? And let's say you want to do something that is GPU compatible. What about, let's say you want to do it yourself. There's a lot of work that goes into developing these CUDA kernels and a lot of specialized knowledge that doesn't transfer across quite well. So it's kind of, and, if you, and for, I'm, I'm of the view that every line of code you write is a line of code you have to support. So writing a CUDA kernel is a lot of work that you have to support for, in the future. Another thing that's is probably a bit nitpicky for me is a lack of streaming. Um, this is, uh, the GPU, CPU over, have high overheads. So sending small bits of information back and forth is not a really good use of your GPU. I think this is, the mo uh, this is obviously noticeable to me in, when I do any kind of like signal processing kind of work. But RL, reinforcement learning, is a really good example of something that is extremely um, influenced by this. Like you see DQN, which tries to like batch past samples and replays and send all that to run forward instead of just sending single states forward to trying to get a sense of what action should take. That's basically one of the things because our GPUs literally, the, the overhead of sending one versus 500 is not a huge difference. And you might as well get like a bit of an historical like overview of what happened. Anyway, so I'm gonna quickly summarize. Um, fundamentally, CPUs have high single threaded performance with large amounts of memory. They've, one of the things I really wanna talk about is that they're very flexible and easy to program. You don't have to worry too much about how they work. Um, GPUs have multiple slower cores. Uh, memory limits is much more limited and it's optimized for tensor ops. You can get incredible imp improvements, but they are also much more inflexible. So it all depends on what's good for you. Now I have some other hot takes, but I'm gonna skip over them because I'm running, running over time. And I wanna say thank you everyone for who came today. I think we, I think we have time for one or two questions. Okay. Do we have any questions? Uh, given the lack of questions, can we please see your hot takes? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, just as an, uh, I may have the different opinions. So I am, for people who know me, I, I, I think deep learning is great, but I don't think it's the be all and end all. Um, so first of all, if you think of investing in GPUs, first check what you're doing and before going and investing in GPUs. Think about the algorithm first. Let that lead you to where you need to go. Don't fit like, don't just throw XG boost in there, um, and deep learning just because it's the coolest thing. Think about your problem. Um, wrap it, if you can use off the shelf code, use it. Do not try and develop your own code. One thing I wanted to point out, this is something that I've dealt with in the past, is that device, you know, money, device RAM is the biggest limitation. So don't, don't skimp there. Just buy the most expensive card that you can really afford. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that local hardware tends to pay itself off quite quickly. One of the reasons that NVIDIA is pushing the DGX is it actually does kind of make sense. Um, it's really convenient to have things locally, especially in Sydney where the internet can be iffy. Trying to deal with cloud data transfers can be annoying. Mid-scale does get a bit awkward, but that's one thing. Opinions on multi-GPU, um, I would say the best thing, if you have four GPUs, run four independent experiments simultaneously. Don't try and use multi-GPU setups to start with. I'm of the opinion they're unlikely to be worth it for most, unless of course you have an off-the-shelf thing like Cat Boost or XG Boost that automatically scales. Um, and I would also recommend that if you're doing multi-GPU training, you should be looking, you need a strong engineering team and you need to be like thinking not just four GPUs in a node, but you need many, many GPUs. That's the scale you should be going at. I think until then, just stick with one GPU training and you will, yeah, you'll probably like be happier for it. All right, those are my hot takes. <laughs> thank you, Varun. Those hot takes took the perfect <laughs> amount of time. So, small <laughs> oh, thank you so appreciation. much.
Um, and thanks again. So we have 